opening image to Echo is a spiral of a glowing tapeworm, a winding dog turd after Wolfie ate some plutonium. I'm not sure what I'm looking at here, but I do know one thing. It's not the least bit intriguing. Why would anyone watch Echo until the next cut? I guess to break down why it's a terrible opener. Echo's opening image is the neon sign on an empty dark street that flashes closed. An opening image, amongst other things, establishes the setting, theme, and tone. But the more I think about it, the first image being a nuke duke is ironically accurate. The next shot is more confusing than the last. Now we are in a cave? What am I looking at? A close-up of the pool? Where is the irradiated dog turd in reference to any of this? A figure emerged from the water. She's naked. That's a plus. But she looks like she got mud or blood or bloody mud on her skin. I don't know. Doesn't make much sense seeing that she's emerged out of the water. Others rise from various watery holes. You're not sure who they are, where they came from, or why your TV is still on. Where are we? A surface of a planet or a cave? Maybe this is Kevin Feige's colonoscopy and these are his polyps. A wider shot reveals that the cave ceiling is riddled with bioluminescence. Feels like they might be in another world. Tries to give off the feeling that this is the night sky. Instead, you're leaving wondering, why? What am I looking at? I don't care about any of this shit. The main thing I should be interested in, what's going to happen, or what is happening. Instead, I'm thinking about monster truck tires and daydreaming about hitting a walk-off Grand Slam for the Yankees. I'm thinking about questions like, in ancient Rome, how does Augustus reconcile absolute rule with the Republican ideal? I'm pondering what is the largest mammal I think I can knock out with a single punch. I'm thinking about everything but this show. We're only a minute in. Finally, something interesting happens. Geography is established. Usually this is done from the very beginning. In the film industry, we call these types of shots establishing shots. It's a standard practice to set up the context of the scene ahead. Carefully design these type of shots and form the audience where the action will be taking place. It shows the relationship between people and objects. These kind of shots can do more than just set up physical space as they are often used to reveal character or plot information. Establishing shots are commonly wide shots, especially at the very beginning of a film. Because the establishing shot is at the beginning of a scene, it also used to set a particular tone or mood for what the audience is about to see. This was of course ignored for the avant-garde shot of a nuclear dump. But now we know where this atom smashing shit is in context of these characters. The center of the chamber with a protruding butthole. The characters slowly walk up to the anus because that's how they move in this world. Slow, much like the first minute of the show. Our Lady in Mud kneels at the wrinkle rim and drinks the hot doo-doo water. The spirals light up in the palm of her hands to indicate something. Maybe she's got powers now. Maybe it's typhoid from drinking contaminated water. Before you worry too much about her health, something else happens. That is neither interesting nor logical, which is how the rest of this opening scene is going to go down. Anyways, a bird lands in her hand. She looks at it like she's about to do something that will captivate you, like crush the bird until one of his eyes squishes out of its sockets. Everyone waits in eager anticipation for the fate of this bird. When the tension can't get any higher, your expectations are wildly subverted. The bird flew away. A woman would never harm an innocent creature, let alone flatten its guts out. Why were you hoping for that to happen, you sick bastards? Kill it, okay? Just kill it. The roof begins to collapse. Nuclear waste is spilling out of the anus like hot cave caca. By this time, you hope the mud-borne troglodytes are crushed. What is it with you and the crushing? Instead of them doing the natural thing, which is to run for the nearest exit, they try to stop the cave collapsing with their bare hands. So with this information, we can deduce drinking from the cave's hot asshole did not give them super strength and can only assume that they are all retarded with typhoid fever. Once again, nothing in this cave has been explained at all. So why should I give a shit if it collapses on any of them? There's no investment in telling this story. No interesting visuals. Not one frame of this is displayed with competent filmmaking. At two minutes and 20 seconds, the cave collapses, fade to white, but the prologue is not over. Now we are inexplicably outside in a field. Our blood mud woman is shielding her eyes. On her shoulder is the same bird from the cave. This might be the filmmaker's way of threading the two scenes together. It was pretty dark in the cave. Maybe people won't understand these are the sh eaters from the previous scene. The mud flakes off her skin. It's CGI, of course. You never seen mud flake off like this before. It was very necessary to have this animated. This is where the filmmakers were worried most. Not the story, context, characters, or geography of where we are. Sure, it looks like CGI, but how are you going to know a team of hundreds of animators worked on this effect if it looked real? Do you really want a striking and compelling story? The filmmakers find this kind of thing beneath them, along with logic and rationality. Like some 
some explanation on where this tribe got its clothes after escaping the cave that crushed them. That would have been nice. Blood Mud tells the group to follow her. A kid whispers, No, she didn't, kid. Hate to break it to you, but Blood Mud is an idiot. Her family is even more smooth brain than she is for following her into the woods. Stupid! You're so stupid! We cut to finger puppets over a hung bed sheet. We can only assume the shadowy hands are telling the story since this is the first image they want us to see. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? A voiceover narration of a dull and confusing prologue cut to a bed sheet. This is all making you sleepy by design. Oh wait, no, there's children attached to those hands. One of them is telling the story. It's most likely not deaf girl Echo, who thinks cousins equal sisters, despite being told numerous times cousins are cousins. No. We're cousins. Eventually, the cousin decides it's best to just smile. You can work around being deaf or blind, but you can't fix stupid. Speaking of stupid, the filmmakers once again failed to establish where the f*** we are. Thunder roars off in the distance. Both girls look to the ceiling, the attic, maybe the sky. Your guess is as good as mine because once again we have a lack of an establishing shot. It's not until four minutes into the opening do we find something relatable. Grandpa is wrapping up a funny story. Well, funny to the actors who were paid to laugh. They do so unconvincingly. But look off into the distance over the character's shoulders and you will see where the tent Echo and her sister cousin make finger puppets. Here is the establishing shot at the tail end of the scene. Even Neil Breen understands this is a bad idea and he's Neil fuck Breen. Who am I? What am I? Grandma and Grandpa leave. On a fence post sits the bird from the prologue. What does this mean? No, really, I'm asking you because I lost interest long ago. Five minutes in, it's raining and the parents are doing the dishes in the kitchen when the second relatable thing happens. The parents bet on how long the girls are going to stay out in the rain. But here's where Marvel's Echo gets as sharp as a marble again. The parents are signing their dialogue to each other. Are they deaf too or just too stupid to realize they don't have to sign to each other? The girls run inside the kitchen demanding chocolate milk. They're all out of chocolate milk. Damn, this is compelling TV. <laughs> But mom isn't a normal mom. A normal mom would say, tough titties, kid. Have some water because it's raining outside. Yet yeah, Echo's mom is so nice, she not only offers to go get chocolate milk in the rain at night, but Echo could go along with her. Not her sister cousin, though. She's apparently the elephant girl you don't want to be seen with in public. I mean, look how disturbing her cute face is. Yuck. Couldn't the filmmakers at least have mom ask if she wanted to come along or wanted to stay home with Echo's dad? No, just ignore her existence from here on out. That's cool. Can you go sit in the closet and wait for them to come back home, sweetie? You're scaring the dog. And in no way is this setting up a disaster on the horizon. Smash cut into the interior of a truck. No, not Echo's mom's truck. The grandparents' truck, of course. Something is eating away at grandma. Grandpa asks if the ancestors are in her ear, and if they are, to ask them for something good. Like Powerball. I'm sure this scene isn't worthless. Look, they have already telegraphed something bad is going to happen. A storm is overhead, it's raining at night, and there's a woman driving. You can see it coming from a mile away. But just in case you didn't, Grandma and Grandpa exposition here is going to make sure you understand to your maximum capabilities that something bad will happen. It smash cuts to the interior of Mom's truck, which means the previous scene is just as worthless as buying a chance to name a star. Hey, there's something I want to talk to you about, actually, Jermaine. Um, it's not good news. Plant Jermaine. Supernova. When did this happen? Uh, about four million years ago. Mom and Echo drive along. They smile at each other. Maybe nothing bad will happen after all. I mean, what happens after smiles? More smiles. But then you remember the whole woman driving in the rain at night bit. Mom's brakes don't work. She pumps them. Why is she braking? Don't know. It hasn't been established where she is. <laughs> Maybe she sees a deer in the road or the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. We don't know until it cuts to a wide shot of the crossroads. You know, the establishing shot. The lack of dramatic irony, where the viewer knows something the characters don't, is frustrating from an audience's point of view, but comical from a filmmaker's perspective. Is this crossroads coming up symbolism? If it is, it's accidental. Speaking of accidents, here's the moment you've been waiting for. The truck t-bones into mom, getting an instant kill on her. 
Echo is still alive, with a shard of glass the size of an elephant tusk sticking through her shin. Where the hell did this piece of glass come from? Was the truck that T-boned them made strictly of window panes? Was Echo holding a picture frame and it wasn't established? Has the entire team of riders on Echo never been in a car before? Have they never seen a car accident? Did they fire the entire props department before they shot this scene? Do they not know none of the glass in a car would ever break like this? This show is so dumb, even Willy Wonka couldn't sugarcoat it. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. Look at this damn thing. It's the size of a tree branch sticking out of this little girl's leg. Through some dramatic irony and realistic ways car accidents happen, this scene could have saved the show from itself through tension and character building. Humor me for a moment, if you will. Instead of mom asking Echo if she wants to go to the store, Echo demands it. She even becomes a brat about it. Maybe mom has always had a soft spot for Echo due to her disability, and it's hard for her to say no, but she's not happy about it either. Echo wants her sister cousin to come along as well, but mom says no. They need to have a one-on-one -on -one about the way she talks to her parents. Echo pouts about this too. Mom backs out of the driveway to a close-up revealing the brake line is bleeding out. We can see that from its amberish tone and her difficulty to stop her reverse. While on the road, they stop at a crossroads to let traffic go by. Once again, a difficult stop that almost slips her into traffic. Mom doesn't think too much about it though because it's raining and has to pay attention to Echo's hands while she whines about chocolate milk and her sister cousin not being able to go along. Echo even cusses at her at one point. Her mom can't keep her eyes on the road with Echo talking like this. Mom verbally tells her not to use that kind of language. Maybe Echo even says something uglier, like she wishes her mom was dead. Mom, hurt and coming to another crossroads, says don't you ever say that. You don't mean that. One day I'll be gone and you'll be sorry. She depresses the brakes but... This time they don't work. She pumps them, but with each push of her foot, more fear rises. Not knowing the situation, Echo is still back-talking her mom. Her hands are flailing all over the place. Mom braces Echo for impact, sacrificing herself to save her daughter. The center console crushes Echo's leg, pinning her into her seat, helplessly looking at the face of her mother that only moments before she wished dead. I mean, sh that isn't perfect, but there's enough for Echo to go on with a chip on her shoulder, and it would establish why she's so easily drawn under Kingpin's wing. Instead, the audience is treated to some third-rate storytelling. You're never given enough information to understand where you are, what's going on, who these characters are, or the theme of the show. I can only assume that this is how the rest of the show is going to go, because I turned it off after these first three scenes. Your first scene is everything to a piece of entertainment. It establishes not only theme, story tone, characters, and conflict, but it is also also your hook to keep people invested. A carefully crafted opener will propel your audience forward. An opening shot works the same way. It's the fires of the VC village in Apocalypse Now, as images slowly dissolve over our protagonist in his hotel room, noting the hellish nightmare he's about to take on. It is the planets aligning with 2001 A Space Odyssey, as thus spoke Zarathustra, slams its promise that something celestial and heavenly is about to take place. It is the documentary interviews of Band of Brothers that explains to you that this was what your predecessors had to go through to win World War II. A shot of a nuclear dog turd doesn't really hook the audience, but it does telegraph to them what the rest of the show is made of. That is one big pile of shit. If you enjoyed this video, you go ahead and smash that like button. While you're done doing that, hit the subscribe button. And then after that, share this with your friends, family, people you hate. Maybe you don't like my content and just want to waste somebody's time. Do it. Share it. Thank you. It is much appreciated. I'm out of here.